Oh, average, yeah, yeah, as it relates to average variable cost. So last time, the, um, the picture that I drew was uh, got average variable, average total. And so the question becomes, do companies operate at a loss? Well, of course they do, right? But what loss is acceptable to stay in operating with and what losses are not? What's not acceptable is if, if the price is less than the average variable cost. So here's the minimum of the average variable cost. If that is, um, if the cost per unit at this quantity here is uh, $10 and we're only able to get $8 per unit, you'd never want to produce at that quantity because not only are you losing the rent, of the fixed cost, but you're also losing $2 per unit. That's stupid. However, if you're at $12 per unit, now losing, pr producing at a loss still makes some sense because you're losing less money than if you were producing nothing. If you produce nothing, remember, you still have to pay your fixed cost. So now at $12, we're having a $2 per unit amount above our average co variable cost that helps contribute towards the rent. We're not paying at all, so we're still losing money, but we're losing less money than we would be if we didn't produce. So that's the average variable cost con concept. Okay. Other ones on the sheets. I think there's one specifically that had to do with like a hotel or something. Like I don't know if I want to do that. Okay. I, think, I don't think it has to do with present value, but I don't remember. Do you remember what chapter? Uh, oh, present value, then it'll be chapter five. Five, yeah. Let's see, as long as I got this one pulled up, um, Karen wasn't able to join us because she had a um, commitment with her kids. But this is kind of similar to what we were just talking about, so let me. This was. Um, Problem 4.2 with the uh, revenue and cost per unit. I know this is too small for somebody to see. Um, it's not going to be real necessary with what I'm going to do. I guess I can try to blow it up a little bit. But... So we had the game day shuttle. Uh... Or someone else? No, no, this is for somebody else. I'll oh, come okay. back to yours in a sec. But Karen, who's not on, but it's being recorded, she asked me about this one. Um, did anybody have any questions here? I think I kind of worked it through with her. Just this is an important distinction between marginal cost and total cost, the change in total cost each time, so that you go from 30 to 36 is six dollar marginal cost, and then six to eight is 12, and then ultimately um, where we're going to make the most money is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And that's how we maximize profits. So that will uh, kind of continue to hammer in on. Um, but that gets us kind of started with the flow. Is everybody good on that one? I think I kind of worked it out, but I thought since I had it pulled up here, I would show that. All right. Um, let's see. So. Week two. I guess I should have closed all the way out of that. Uh, what did you say, the hotel one? Yeah, it was. It should be six. I think it was toward the bottom. It was like five, six, or seven. It might be that. It's not. I think it's seven. I thought that one. Yeah. Okay. So in early 2008, you purchased and remodeled a 120-room hotel that handled increased number of conventions. By mid-2008, it became apparent that the recession would kill demand for conventions. Uh, yeah. Now you forecast to be able to sell only 10,000 room nights, which costs $80 per room. You spent $25 million on the hotel in 2008, and your cost of capital was 20%. Uh, the current going price to sell of the hotel is $20 million. Okay, so if you put it up for sale. 
if the estimated demand is 10,000 room nights, uh, what's the break even price? Okay, so what was your question? I think it was just where to put uh, like, like it is a because it doesn't have to do with uh, you have to pay the capital uh, cost of capital into the. Yeah, you know, I was just I was just confused on our explanation almost. It was like saying you had to subtract some stuff because you like lost. You know, make an adjustment. For like um, discounting, yeah. Like what uh, night? Because is that what they did? Is they went in? Um, so with this one, it's indefinitely. They were probably using. Uh, remember, the cost of capital is the opportunity cost of the true cost. So I think they did it in perpetuity, like we did that one problem, right? So they did. Did they just show the um, interest rate? So it was like yes, the, uh, I believe so. I think it was just point basically two. the cap rate formula is the price or the value is equal to the cash flow divided by the interest rate uh, or the rate. So this yeah. would have been the twenty percent and the cash flow of whatever. I guess you'd have to calculate it or yeah, I used to put my money in. Yeah, what would you need to break even on that? So you were able to calculate the cash flow on that? I, yeah, eighty dollars per night. So you had to do some sort of calculation like that. Does that sound about right? I think I'd have to go look uh, look at a picture or something. Yeah, Jason. The way it had us do it, because I got it wrong the first time, so I paid attention to the answer it gave um, on how to solve it, and it took um, the opportunity cost, so how much you could have sold the hotel for times the cost of capital divided by the rooms, how many rooms you would need to do per night. Yeah. Okay, I think, like, yeah, the, then I like, added on, like, like, it added on, like, the $80 per room. It, it was just a weird, like, how many times. Yeah. I think it was, like, like yeah, for example, I had sense. different numbers. It was, like, Sold so this million. is the answer, explanation answer. So break even price is the average avoidable cost. So we could have uh, the avoidable cost include the 20 million that it could have been recovered. So that's your opportunity cost from the sale. So then 20,000 times 20 percent, 10,000 roommates plus 80 dollars per unit, 480 per room per night is the break even price. Oh, it's, it's, we were looking for price on that. Okay, questions? Yeah, it started to make sense like when I like when I missed it the first time and like when I went back and looked yeah. at how they did it. Some of the yeah. questions are gonna be like that. So yeah. really, they kind of push you and challenge you to, mm -hmm. to see where, where you're at. I was just trying to figure out what, how the eighty dollars per room came because it was like and I was trying to figure out how to put it in the formula. Okay, but so yeah, that gave you the the upfront the eighty of what you're getting. So you're just gonna you're gonna get that for sure. Okay, other ones. I got time for one more. If anybody's got a burning question. Let me uh, since it kind of ties into. Uh, a little bit from before and now. Let me let me get you a little bit better stuff in your notes on long run, short run distinction. Sounds like a good place to start off. Make sure that's in your notes. So and then we're going to get into demand. But let me just put that down here a little bit. So so the long run is a period of time in which all resources can vary. So we can put in parentheses here, all costs are variable 
in the long run. It's kind of a, another way to think about it. So we talk about variable costs and oh, those change with quantity. Well, in the long in a long enough period of time, you can change the size of the building, you can change the amount of computers, you, you can change anything. So all costs are variable costs in the long run. So in the short run, which is typically where we're going to find our decision making as a manager, right? It's like something's fixed. Like, what, what are we going to do today? How are we going to make a change today? How are we going to make a change this week? How much are we going to change this month? What can we do this quarter to increase sales, right? So almost every decision realistically has a short run component to it. So most of them are here. So in the short run is uh, a period of time in which at least one resource is fixed. And if you want to put in parentheses, this creates a fixed cost. It's a cost we can't change. So how long is the long run for John Deere? Everybody go to John Deere and make those green tractors, right? So if we think about John Deere wanting to open up a new factory and expand their business, how long do you think that would take? Like they say, oh, we want to open up a new factory in Ottawa, Kansas. They just made a decision in the boardroom, the CEO, all the bigs made the decision. We're going to open up a factory in Ottawa, Kansas. From the time they decide that, how long do you think it takes before that factory is up and running, making John Deere tractors? Five years? That could be five years. What do you think? Minimum of two years. An absolute minimum, I would think, has my former real estate development uh, career, um, just going through city council, getting permits, acquiring the land, all this kind of stuff could take a year all by itself. And then all the stuff that goes into making a plant. So for John Deere, I mean, who knows? It could be anywhere from, you know, minimum of two to five years. I would, I would agree with you that it could be that long. Um, how long is the long run for, uh, a photography store, I should say store for business, in the basement of your house. So imagine that we take senior photos, maybe some wedding photos, right? We're running a photography business. How long is the long run for them? Two months. Two months? Now. Yeah, maybe a new place to rent real quick or something. Um, if they have a piece of equipment, even the fancy, you know, gray screens and silver umbrellas or whatever that they have, I mean, any of that can be ordered probably within a two-week window even, right? So probably two weeks to four weeks is probably pretty realistic for that business. So the important part here is that Long run, short run distinctions are not like, oh, it's one year, it's two years, or it's or it's one week, or it's two weeks. It totally is dependent upon that particular business. How long does it take to bury anything you got? Right? How long can you how long will it take to expand into something else? Okay, and then that concept there of the physical resources ends up being the key thing that drives the cost of production. The short run cost and the long run cost. And I guess the key principle that we keep hammering on in these chapters is that as a decision maker, you can't change the fixed costs, right? And so that changes your decision criteria of whether something will be profitable or not over that period of time, whether something's a good move or not. You just want to analyze the uh, costs and benefits of that particular move. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so 
This chapter gets us started into pricing principles. And so that means we need to think about the consumer. And for me, the place to start with the consumer is with the demand curve. So tonight we uh, embark on that little journey. And I like to start off with the law, the law of demand. The law of demand. So it sounds pretty, pretty official, and I think it is. And so it goes something like this. As the price of a product or service increases, the quantity demanded does what? Price goes up, people buy more or less? Less, less right? So as the price of a product or service increases, the quantity demanded decreases. That is the law of demand. Pretty official. Now, can anybody give me examples of where the law of demand doesn't work so hot? Where we see price going up and quantity going up. Luxury vehicles. So price gets higher and we end up selling more. Apple products. So we jack up that iPhone 10 and we can sell more of them. And why is that with the Apple, do you think? Because of new technology or change, change in technology that's more appealing, maybe, for consumer preferences. Okay, and it's the newest, latest, greatest thing, maybe. Yeah, keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, keeping up with the Joneses is the new thing. Got it? Okay. Any other examples? Medicine. So if you're a uh, diabetic and they double the price of insulin and you're going to die otherwise, then you're still going to buy the same amount of insulin that you had before? Would you increase the amount of insulin you buy? Probably not, right? So we do, this is, this is a stronger statement here. We're looking for something where the price goes up and the quantity you buy also goes up. So with insulin, uh, you're not going to cut back maybe, but you're also likely not going to need more than what's prescribed to you. What's that? Yeah, gas, you know, that's kind of the typical one. That, and we're going to talk, kind of flesh this out more, but yeah. As the price of gas goes up, you're probably not going to buy more. And if you're going to do anything, you might carpool once in a while, even though you normally drove by yourself. You might jump on your bicycle and bike, not every day, but maybe some of the days, right? You're not going to sell your car. So you might cut back on gasoline. But um, you're correct, people don't tend to cut back on those prices that much, or cut back on their quantities rather than that much. Okay, so what you guys are touching on is that this law is complete crap, the way I have it written. And I, I could come up with a thousand other things. Um, you know, do you, do you buy less stuff if your income doubled? Right? So the price went up by 10%, but your income went up by 100%. Would you necessarily cut your purchases back because price went up 10%? Not when your income goes up 100%, right? So there's lots of different ways that we can bust this law. And so the, very, the most, two most important words of this definition are missing. I, I left them off intentionally. I intentionally try to trick uh, economic students each and every time. And that is a Latin word, ceteris, Paribus. Ceteris paribus. Now I get to pick on my econ students especially. I will be disappointed if they, well, I'd just be disappointed. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Because, you know, you, life goes on and you forget about ceteris paribus type stuff. Uh, but nonetheless, Alex and Jason, you are in the hot seat. Uh, give me a number between four and ten, Drew. Seven. seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Alex. Better <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
care of us. You're in the hot seat. What does that mean? Um, it's like uh, pulling all those costs. Good. That's it. Yep. Good. You, you pass. I, I'm proud. <laughs> I mean, well, I don't even know if I'm proud. I'm not disappointed. I'm not disappointed. Yeah, maybe, like maybe a hint of pride in there too. Because that means something stuck after those four years of uh, trying to get through this. This is good. Okay, so what we're going to do when we make the statement is we're going to hold all of the things constant. Right? Everything like your income, you said it doubled? No, we're not going to allow that to happen. That stays constant. The coolness of the Apple thing, that it's now cool, we're not going to allow that to happen. That's a different variable other than price. So we're going to hold all of the things constant. So Setters Paribus is holding all other, all other things constant. Okay, so the demand curve can take on different shapes. And so if I was to draw two demand curves here, one for, let's call it good A, and one for good B, and good A looks like that, and good B looks like that. Which one of these two demand curves, and notice that both follow the law, right? So this relationship is a negative relationship between price of the good and quantity. So this is the price of good A and the quantity of good A. If the price goes up, people buy less. And this is the price of good B and the quantity of good B. As the price goes up, people buy less. So both of these demand curves follow the law of demand. Which one's gasoline, do you think, A or B? We brought up gasoline. Which one's Gasoline. B? C B? Okay, so people aren't going to pay more, so they're going to go ride their bike a lot, or? So if it's, it's not going to be making gas because people still are going to use gas, but they just won't use it. Like, so which one's showing that we're using? We're, we're reducing gas, but not so much. Is it A or B? B. B? Okay, let me, let me kind of do this for a little help if we're still a little foggy on this. So let's say the price of gas here is, um, uh, what are we at here? $2.60, depending on where you're at. And so at $2.60 on demand curve A, we've got QA, or Q1, let's call it. Q1, and here we've got Q1 in the B graph, and then we're going to look at another price of $2.40, and we've got Q2, and we've got Q2. So if we increase the price from 240 to 260, which one is showing gasoline where people aren't changing their consumption very much? A, right? So it's this more vertical one where people are being less responsive to the price change. So the fancy word that we're learning on this chapter is that this demand curve is more elastic. more elastic. This demand curve is less elastic. So elasticity is a concept that's actually a number that measures the responsiveness of consumers to the price change. Okay, so the price elasticity of demand. I'm going to use the symbol 
uh, kind of sigma uh, subscript D, the price elasticity of demand, it is a number that shows the responsiveness of quantity demanded to a given change in price. A number that shows the responsiveness of quantity to a given change in price. So more elastic means more responsive. Now here in Ottawa, we've got what four, or five gas stations. Did you know Blue Skies? Yeah, that's gonna be another one. So we've got what Casey, two Casey's up on the north end, plus that other place, the Phillips. That would be three on the north side, and then on the south side, we've got the Auto Mini Mart, that other one, that is right, Chopper, right, right, right. and Chopper Gas. Yeah, yeah. Casey's on seven. Like, yeah, the, oh yeah, the other Casey's out there. So we got like seven places. Let's just call it. Um, so which one of these demand curves, A or B, represents the demand for price chopper gas? Which one represents price chopper gas? Not just gasoline in general, but price chopper gasoline in the city of Ottawa. Which one better reflects price chopper gasoline, A or B? Probably B, I still see some A's. There's just more options, so yeah, they're going to go down, but there's so many gas stations that it wouldn't, it could have an effect, but not as well. Yeah, so you're, you're right. So if Chopper only raises their price from 240 to 260, are people going to go to Price Chopper or are they going to go down the block to the little mini mark or the Phillips 66? Right, just go down to the mini mark. So if gasoline prices in all of Ottawa due to market forces are going up from 240 to 260, and all the gas stations are kind of reflecting that price. You guys observe this, right? Price of gasoline is about the same anywhere you go in Ottawa. There's not dramatic price differences. Maybe a penny here or there, but basically the same. And so that's going to be the, the look for gasoline but any one particular gasoline place, it might be very elastic. Price chopper raises the price, everybody goes down the block to the competitive, right? So the demand for their gasoline might look like this, whereas gasoline in general might look like this. So one of the things that determine the elasticity is the availability of substitutes. And that's kind of an important concept that will continue on for us as we move into further chapters on pricing. Okay, so definition, a number that shows the responsiveness to a given change in price. And some key points. More substitutes means more elastic. So example, gasoline versus price chopper gasoline. Price chopper gas has lots of substitutes. Gasoline in general does not. So less substitutes, like riding your bike isn't the best substitute for uh, driving your car. And so that's an important connection there uh, for elasticity on how responsive people are and the way that demand curve is going to look, whether it's relatively flat or relatively steep. OK, questions or comments on that point? 
Point number two is the fraction of income spent on the good. As you're at Price Chopper paying for your gas, it turns out Price Chopper just jacked up the price of bubble gum from a dollar to a dollar ten, a ten percent increase. Do you give a dollar? Or do you still buy the gum? You still buy the gum. So if the Ford dealership jacks up the price of a car from twenty thousand dollars to twenty two thousand dollars, might that be something you take a second look at? Maybe you shop around a little bit, right? So when the good represents a smaller fraction of your income, people aren't as worried about price. They're not as price sensitive. So when we have bubble gum, which one's bubble gum here, A or B? B? A. So you don't come. Sometimes it's, your gut kind of turns you upside down. That's why we work through this. That's okay to be wrong. I love that you, you keep firing off answers, Wes. That's that's good. In fact, I'm going to give you an extra credit point for a wrong answer because that's what I like to do sometimes, just to encourage dialogue in the classroom. Uh, that is a good thing. All right, so Wes has been wrong twice in a row. His gut has led him astray, but yet he gets an extra credit Kind of fairness for one here. Okay, well, there's, there's a method. There's a method to my madness. So you guys keep keep firing away, firing the cannons. So if bubble gum, if you don't really care about price, you're less sensitive to prices, right? So you have the opportunity. And then we see this with like water and vending places, and that's why we're uh, willing to pay a little bit more money. And, and you know, I think uh, movie theaters and stadiums kind of push this to the nth degree. Like, oh, well, I guess. You can't go anywhere else for popcorn or soda or a bottle of water. So let's uh, raise that from a dollar up to five dollars and see what we can soak out of it, right? Because you're less sensitive um, at that point in time for a variety of other reasons. Okay, the last thing here then. So let me put here example gum versus cars. And then the third thing I want to put is the length of time. So the length of time allowed for adjustment. So this one kind of ties into the substitutes. So do we allow the consumers a day to figure something out. So imagine if you've got a, uh, uh, a dish that you're making for company coming over on a Friday night and you need broccoli. You run to the store, it turns out Price Chopper jacked up the price on broccoli. Well, you need it tonight, right? So that particular day in the moment, your demand might look like this. But over the period of a month, you might start to avoid broccoli dishes, right? You'll look for substitutes. Oh, maybe we can do cauliflower. You know, broccoli prices are just out of the roof. Maybe we can do carrots, right? Maybe we can do something else. So the more time you allow for adjustment, the flatter that demand curve will be if we allow more time to elapse. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so let's do a little formula busting here. So we got to do it. We'll try to keep it as painless as possible. So the elasticity of demand, the formula for it, that's a number that is the ratio of the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in price. So it's a number that's a ratio of the percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in price.
So how do you find the percentage change? Well, you take the new number minus the old number and divide it by usually the original number is how we do percentage changes. But we're not going to do that here because we want it to work the same way whether it was a price increase or a price decrease. So usually it's the new number minus the old number divided by the old number is how you do percentage changes typically in math class. But for this, we're going to use this uh, arc method. Your book actually talks about both. But we're just going to take the average of the two, the average quantity. And then we're going to do the same thing for price. The new price minus the old price divided by the average price. Okay, so before we scare you too much into this, a lot of the book problems are just going to give you the percentage change. So you won't actually even have to do that part. That might say, suppose that uh, the percentage change in price is 10%, or that the company is posing a 10% price change, and the elasticity of demand is 1.2. You know, what, what would be the effect on quantity or something like that? So we're going to use it in different ways. So right now, it's just important to kind of see how we're calculating it. And then I think it's also good to see how that relates to this graph down here. So we're going to do one real quick just to make sure we're all on the, on the same page. And so this is also in the Principles of Microeconomics textbook. gives even more details. The textbook goes into a, a decent amount, but if you want to review that, there'll be a, an elasticity chapter in that Principles book. Um, as well. So let's just take a demand curve, downward sloping according to the law of demand. And so let's just say we move from uh, $10 and 100 units and $8 to 120. So these are two points along the demand curve, point A and point B. And so now we're just going to plug and chug this formula. So notice that the average of the two numbers of 10 and 8 is what? 10 and 8, average of the two, 9, right? So 9, and then the average of these two is 110. And kind of, if you want to conceptually think about it, how it relates here, is we're kind of centering it between these two points. A percentage change is what we're trying to do. So go ahead and uh, try to work that out. And I don't have this prepared ahead of time, so you're going to have to help me out here. But I can kind of crank through some of this uh, formula. So we got new minus the old. So we might need to know which one's the new, which one's the old. So how we'll do that in the book is, should we be able to do a price increase or decrease? Wes, increase or decrease? Decrease. So we're going to call this P1, so that's the old number, and P2 is the new number. So we're decreasing price from $10 to $8. And of course, P1 is associated with Q1, 100 units. And P2 at $8 is associated with Q2, 120 units. So then just fill in, uh, fill in the gaps here. So new minus old.
What's 9 divided by 11? 0.8 We'll just write it out to there. And then that's a negative sign. Why is there a negative sign for it? Because of the downward sloping, yes. So the law of demand means that price elasticities are always going to be negative. Because if we would have went the other direction, it would have been 100 minus 120, and it would have been 10 minus 8. So the negative sign is always going to pop up because of the law of demand. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. It's important to keep in mind because I think it's pretty much just to trick econ students, but sometimes we talk about elasticities as a positive number. So we'll say that the elasticity of demand is 0.8 for this problem. And we're like, well, I thought it was negative 0.8. Well, everybody knows it's negative, so let's just not waste breath. This is economists thinking here, like, oh, well, that would be a waste of breath if we said the word negative. That would be uh, a little extra time we're wasting. So since we all know that it's negative, we'll often talk about that as a positive. So that's one thing let's put down in our notes that you might see come up. So note, the formula always creates a negative number due to law of demand. And it's common to think about it in its absolute value. So therefore, It's common to literally speak about it as the absolute value of the elasticity of demand. So this is our little math notation for taking the absolute value of it. So we would say, oh, well, the elasticity of demand for gasoline is 0.8. And so we wouldn't say the word negative. Okay, questions so far on that? You guys good online? Thumbs up if you're okay so far? Make sure you're still breathing. Anna, I didn't see thumbs up. Or you got a question? Oh, I'm still, I'm not hearing you again. I think it's your, oh, you have it on your phone, right? Is that why? You're, yeah. Uh -huh. To confirm the the response for that last question, 0 0.81, negative 0 0.81. Sorry, we can't see the edge of the screen. Yeah. Or the edge of the board. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, you are a little bit let out there. 0 0.81, 0 0.81. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me see if I can do this without unplugging in here. There we go. So the negative 0 0.8181, that's the slope of it? Okay, great question. I was going to kind of come back there next. So uh, the question was, is it the slope of it? And the answer is no. Uh, and let's do that by looking at point C. Since you brought up slope, if this is a straight line, what's this number? Six, right? So let's go six. Let's call that P3. And what's this number? 140. So now, calculate the elasticity again, everybody, going from B to C. So let's go down again, but now your new number, old number, is you're going here between it. And it looks like it would be 0.8. But I'll give you a little foreshadowing. It's not. And that's an important concept. So go ahead and calculate that one out.
what'd you get? Negative point five over. And that's round. That's fine. So it changed on us. What caused the change just from an analytical standpoint of the formula? Looking at what drove a different answer, what was it? Yeah. The average part, right? Because this stayed the same. That was your slope term, getting back to your, to your comment on the slope. So the slope, this, this uh, formula can be shown in a little bit different way that I'm not even going to write on the board. It's in your book. Um, but we could kind of show the slope rise over run because that's basically this part of it, right, is the rise over run. And then the other part is what drives the answer. So as we move along the demand curve this way, the number got smaller. So here, the absolute value of the elasticity was 0.82. Uh, and here, the absolute value of the elasticity was 0.54. And so as we move this direction, it's getting smaller. Now check it out. The reason is, is because of the percentage changes. If we go to the extreme, if we think of a, uh, a really small price increase from $1 to $2, what is that in percentage terms, roughly? Forgetting about the average thing. If I go from $1 to $2, I increase my price from $1 to $2, what kind of price increase is that percentage-wise? 100%, right? It's a huge price increase. But the quantity is so small, it's relatively small. So if we have a huge price increase, percentage-wise speaking, and a small quantity change, then this number is going to be very small. So as we move this way along this, this kind of approaches something uh, close to zero, but never quite gets there. As we move this way along the demand curve, and we think about doubling quantity from one unit to two units, that's a huge quantity change and a very small price change. So this number blows up to infinity. And so the range of elasticities depends on where you're at on the demand curve. Okay, so let's put the range of elasticities as our topic here. So the range of elasticities. So basically the elasticity number in absolute value is going to be something less than infinity along a, a straight line demand curve and greater than zero. So as we move this direction with the elasticity, the percentage change in quantity is a lot bigger than the percentage change in price. And as we move this direction towards zero, that flip-flops so that the percentage change in quantity is less than the percentage change in price. If that number equals one, what's true about the percentage changes? So kind of go back to this formula. If the number, instead of being 0.82 or 0.84, what if the number is one? What can you tell me about the percentage changes? They're the same. They're equal to each other. So when the elasticity of demand is equal to 1, that implies that the percentage change in quantity demanded is equal to the percentage change in price. And we have a special word for that. Demand is unitary elastic. Unitary elastic, it's equal to one. So that's kind of our bubble point that we're going to have for.
the elasticity. It's kind of a turning point for the ranges. So our extreme cases that we have give us the equal sign. So extreme elasticity is What if the demand curve is perfectly vertical? What if the demand curve is perfectly flat? Those are kind of the two extreme cases. So there's no slope to it. No slope. An unusual case, we'd expect them to be, have some slope to them. In fact, real world demand curves tend to be curved, but for simplicity and in small changes, Thinking of them as lines is okay, because I mean, we're not talking about really going over big places. Usually a company is offering a product, they've got their golf clubs spliced at $120 per golf club, right? And when they're thinking about doing a price change, they're like, ah, should we increase price 10% or not? Right, so we're kind of thinking about small changes. So even if it is uh, kind of curved along the whole range, it might be relevant to look in small changes that looking at a line is fine. So, this curve is responsive or unresponsive? Are consumers responsive to price changes or unresponsive? Unresponsive. unresponsive. They're not changing, right? You can jack up the price. So this is heroin. This is cocaine. This is for, for a druggie. Now, they might be able to substitute to something else, but uh, uh, this is insulin, right? This is... Uh, things that are very inelastic. So this is uh, less elastic or inelastic demand. This graph that I have here, this is, and I even put a little bit of a slope, I didn't mean to, that should be perfectly vertical. Uh, but this is perfectly inelastic. So this is perfectly inelastic. In general, inelastic demand happens, inelastic demand occur, or it's said to be inelastic demand when the elasticity of demand in absolute value is less than one. So less than this unitary thing here. This demand curve is perfectly elastic. Perfectly flat. And in general, elastic demand is when the elasticity of demand is greater than one. So notice the connection between what I have written here and what I did here. So when the number is really big, the quantity demanded is greater than the price, that's going to lead to the elasticity of demand being greater than one. The upstairs is bigger than the downstairs. Anytime the upstairs is bigger than the downstairs, we're going to get a number bigger than one, right? So that is elastic demand. And inelastic demand, when the denominator is bigger than the numerator, we end up getting relatively inelastic demand. So what we've done here is we've kind of shown this is like perfectly vertical, perfectly elastic, and then any old downward sloping demand curve, it's going to range at different points along. Of the elastic demand? Well, the one that we did earlier, like if there's a lot of substitutes like price chopper gas, the demand for price chopper gas might look very elastic. 
price shopper raises their price five to 10 cents over per gallon what the competitors across the street are doing, they're gonna lose all the business, right? So it's just anything that there's a lot of substitutes. Anything that there's a lot of substitutes. And that's really something to hang your hat on. Each time you do a problem, think about like how many substitutes are there for this good? If you guys really start to think critically about that, then that'll help as you're kind of doing some of those problems. Furthermore, it will help when we get to the pricing chapter, because that's also what we're going to do when we see how much pricing power we have as a manager at my company. Can I really jack up my price or am I gonna lose all my customers? Or can I bundle things together? So with Price Chopper, the price for gas is this plus an ice cold Coke and a Snickers is free. So now if I start to differentiate my gas from the competitor across the street, that makes less substitutes available, right? And people might still buy my product if I bundle it correctly for them. So that gets into kind of the higher level stuff that we'll get to later. Yes? Oh, is it not plugged in? Or is it given the warning? Oh, that's why, eh, darn it, look at that! Who did this? Last week I forgot to do that. I think Jason got it. Okay, we can kind of fuss with that later. That's why I, I got kind of a message up there, but I wasn't really paying attention to why. Okay, it's dead for a while. Our second camera will get fired up here probably after the break here. We got a little bit. Uh, so hopefully you guys are doing okay with the way the camera's positioned anyway. Okay, anything else? Okay, let's lastly tie this concept of elasticity to total revenue. So what's the profit equation again? Total revenue, revenue total minus total cost. And so this will kind of help us get to thinking about how this makes a difference for my business in terms of money in the cash register. And so it's one of my favorite graphs in economics. So I want you to put two graphs stacked on top of each other. And upstairs, we're going to have a demand curve. So just draw a demand curve that touches both the uh, vertical and horizontal intercepts somewhere. It doesn't really matter what the slope is. You can make it steep or flat, as long as it touches both. So this is our demand curve. And it shows a relationship between price and quantity. And then down here, we're going to measure total revenue. And what was the formula for total revenue in its most simplest, simplistic uh, single product form? What is it? Be brave, go ahead. Total revenue formula. P times Q, good. So price times quantity, right? And so notice the connection here. This is price and quantity. Now this is price and quantity. So they're kind of interrelated that way. That's kind of one of the key things to pick up with this. So if I price my product at zero, what will my revenue be? Zero, zero right? Because it's free. You're not going to make a lot of money doing that. So at a price of zero, you're going to sell a whole bunch of product until people are just sick and tired of the product and you'd have to pay them to take more of it, right? So that's where the demand curve intersects the horizontal axis. So we're going to drop down. We're measuring quantity here on the downstairs graph too. Let's just say, put some numbers up here, that's 1,000 units. And so at a price of 1,000 units, or at a price of zero and a sale of 1,000 units, we make zero total revenue. On the flip side is if I, let's say that this, this price is 100. If I price my good at $110, how much am I going to sell? Zero, right? And even 100 says zero. So I price it too high, nobody buys my product. So P times Q again, 
is zero. So then what we have here is the rest of the story. And so let's start with the price of $100. If I now drop it to 90, am I going to sell more product? If I drop my price from 100 to 90, am I going to sell product? Yeah, right, so I'm gonna have a positive P to Q. So we must be going up with the revenue function, right? So again, I could, I could pick off some numbers here, um, but I, I don't know if I'm brave enough to do that, but um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll get this established. 90 and 10Z. Let's call it 100. So what's my total revenue? 900, so we got $90 per unit times 100 units. 9,000, missed a zero, that's okay. So at 100 units, we now have $9,000 worth of total revenue. So this then represents one point on the revenue function. Okay, so we're gonna keep doing that, but will we always increase revenue no matter how low we make our price? No, we, we reach that tipping point, right? Where from this formula, if I reduce the price and my quantities don't go, uh, or they, they go in the wrong direction, if they're starting to be upside down, then that's not gonna help my revenues. We eventually we get to this point where we have the price so low, we're giving it away. We're selling lots of units, but we're not making any revenue on of it in terms of our total revenue. So here's the trick to this visually. So if you take whatever your graph is at and take the midpoint, it turns out to be kind of a special point. You can just kind of eyeball it on your graph. Wherever that midpoint is, go vertically up to the demand curve. That is the point of unitary elastic. So that's the place where the elasticity of demand is equal to one. Downstairs on Revenue Mountain, that is the turning point of the revenues. And so Revenue Mountain looks like this. It's a parabola that's upside down. So an upside down U, it doesn't really matter too much how you draw it, but the main thing is total revenue is maximized right here at that point. Okay, so let's see, this is where I was getting dangerous. I'm not sure I'm gonna like this or not, but if this midpoint here would be 500, right? And so then what would this number be? Not, So we got a straight line, we were down 10, over 100, down 5, over, so what is it? 50, right? If we're doing equal rise over run, that would be 50. And so 50 times 500 is 25,000. All right, well, let's see if this thing worked here, if McCullough's theory worked out or not. So let's say we drop to 40. At 40, this number is 600. 40 times 600 is 24,000. Ooh, worked. How about <laughs> that? Every once in a while, 24,000. Okay, so that's an important connection between why we care about elasticities when we think about profits and profit maximization. So over on this side, as we move this direction on the demand curve, 
Are the numbers bigger than one or less than one in absolute value? Less. So remember, we went from 0.8 to 0.5 on that last example. So the numbers are getting smaller as we move this direction. So on this section of the demand curve, we have the what we call the inelastic range of the demand curve. All of the numbers are less than one. And on this section of the demand curve, we say that demand is elastic. The elastic range, where the elasticities are greater than one. So, what quantity do we want to be at to maximize profits? 25,000. So, the quantity would be 500. So, question of the day. What quantity do we want to make to maximize And was that US that said quantity 500? Or was that Clayton? Clayton, 500. Does everybody agree with that? Watch you guys catch up a little bit while I change out my marker.
maximize profits, we need to produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is just equal to the cost of last unit. In shorthand notation, produce quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That is kind of the holy grail of business. What I like to call it. Every company out there wants to maximize profit in some way, shape, or form, I would argue. We can get down to the triple bottom line and blah, blah, blah. But benefit and cost is what it's going to boil down to. And so what we want to do is balance that out with additional revenues and additional costs. Kind of think about it this way, with everything we did with the incremental, like break-even analysis and everything, and variable cost, if, should we produce a unit? So here we are producing a, a 500 units, and the question is, should I produce another unit, right? And so we talked about break-even with fixed costs and all that, but it's really kind of simple. It says, should I produce the 501st unit? Well, what's that 501st unit gonna cost me? $3. What's the revenue generated by the 501st unit? $4. So the 501st unit's gonna cost me three, and I'm going to get four. Should I do it? Yeah, that's it. That's what we're doing each and every time we make a decision, is we're using that calculus as our driving force. What are all the revenues? associated with that change in production? What are the costs associated with that change in production? If the revenues exceed the cost, do it. If they don't, don't. That's it. That is an uh, important principle of economics. Okay, so before we take our break, we're gonna have an auction. We're gonna have an auction. A real auction, by the way, with real money. So, um, you guys online are in on this too. So, I just got to move this little message out of my way here so I can see your faces 100% because we got money on the line now. Okay, so this is a book written by Jim Gortney. And I think I mentioned that we started the Gortney Institute here on campus. And this is one of his most famous books. You can buy it on Amazon for about 15 bucks for a hardcover brand new, and this is a brand new book. Uh, inside the cover here, it says $21.99. But value, we'll see, is maybe in the eye of the holder. But you guys can go buy this for 15. What I want to do is hold a real live auction here. This book is going to be sold to the highest bidder. Whoever's in with their bid is going to get it at the end. And just like a normal auction goes, we're just gonna go until it's sold. Does anybody have any questions? So it's a great book. Make a perfect gift for somebody. If after you get done reading it, you can pass it along. Common Sense Economics. Um, do I have an opening bid? Do oh. I have a dollar? Dollar? Dollar. Dollar. Clayton's up for a dollar. So I'm gonna kind of keep track of things because my memory's not always good. So Clayton, one dollar. Hey, do I hear a dollar? Anything or a dollar? Two dollars. Alex is in for two. This is real money, real deal. I'm gonna collect money. I will take an IOU, like if you're short on cash, you don't have to have it on the spot. <laughs> but I do want to collect the money. You guys online are in, and you can, you know, mail your check to me or whatever. That's good. Your money's good with me. Your word. So, anybody want to go over $2? We can go in increments of 50 cents if you want, or whatever. $2 and one penny. $2 and one penny. <laughs> 201. All right. Do I hear higher? $3. $3. Anna's $3 in. $3 and one penny. $3 and one penny. Okay. $4. Alex, you heard what'd you say? Four. Four. <laughs> Alex, four dollars and one penny. Four dollars and a penny. Okay. Yeah, four twelve. Four twelve. Uh, Drew 
room is in for $4.12. Oh, wow. Four Layton's out now. Yeah, the office is in trouble. The office represents the office. Four dollars, twelve cents. Anybody higher? Four fifty. Okay, four fifty, and then I heard a five dollars. But let me get uh, Jason. Four fifty. Alex, you went up to five. Okay, Alex is at five. Five dollars. Do I hear six? 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 Anybody six? Seven dollars. Seven dollars. Who was that? Clayton. Okay. Seven dollars. You can get rid of those here. Track. All right, we're at seven. Do I hear eight? Do I hear eight? Eight, eight, eight. How about nine, nine, nine? We're at seven, seven. Bids on seven. Seven fifty. Seven fifty. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Clayton says enough fooling around. Ten dollars. Do I hear eleven? Sells for fifteen on Amazon. Still getting a hell of a deal. Ten fifty. Alex is in at ten fifty. Ten fifty. Do I hear twelve? Do I hear twelve? Ten fifty. Twelve. Do I hear eleven? Eleven. 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 Up. Oh, Jason's at eleven. Okay, we're at eleven. Do I hear twelve? Twelve. Twelve. Eleven fifty. Eleven fifty. Anybody? Eleven fifty. Just fifty cents more. Eleven fifty. Eleven dollars going less. Twelve. 12. 12. 12. Do I hear 12.50? 12.50. 12.50. 12.50. 12.50. How much? 12.50. Do I hear 13? 13. 13. Do I hear 13? Do I hear 13? 12.50. Anyone want to go half these? Half these. 12.50 going twice. 14. 14. 13. 13. 13. 13. Sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I got 13 now, I got 13. Do I hear 13? Thirteen dollars and one penny. Fifty cent increments. Thirteen fifty. Thirteen fifty. Thirteen fifty one. You can do that, yes. <laughs> I will honor your penny there. That's the way it works. All right. So thirteen fifty, do I hear fourteen oh one? Fourteen oh one. Fourteen oh one. Thirteen fifty one going once. Fourteen oh one. Fourteen oh one. Fourteen oh one. Do I hear fourteen fifty one? Fourteen fifty one. Fourteen fifty one. Maybe fifteen. Fourteen oh one going once. Fourteen oh one going twice. Sold to Jason for fourteen oh one. Fourteen oh one. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll debrief. We'll debrief our auction afterwards. So Jason, I will hold on to this for you in my office. So and you can bring your money and we'll be all set. But I, should, I forgot to mention that all the proceeds go to support the Gordy Institute. So that might have changed your uh, bidding behavior. Maybe you know it was going to a good place. But yes, all of the proceeds go to the Gordy Institute. That book was actually donated by Jim Gordy himself. So. But it was not signed. But uh, all right, we'll take a break here. Let's uh, reconvene in about 15 minutes. So for next week, okay. Um, so uh, let's kind of break down this craziness here. So I wanted to uh, congratulate Jason on being our winner. And so we only had one book, right? So we only had one book. And we have Jason being our winner here at $14.01. And then who was second highest? Was it Clayton? So Clayton was at, uh, I'm not going to be perfectly to scale here, but $13.51. And then who was next? Alex. We dropped down to five? 13. Oh, 13. 13. Alex. Okay, I was a different Alex. Yeah, I'm, and you have an I on here. Is that what you do with your abbreviated name? Okay, I. So let me change that. So this one is Alex. All right. Okay. So what are we down to? 13. And then next? Alex. Then we drop down to five. So it drops down pretty dramatically to five, let's say, here with Alex with an I. And Drew. Yes, Drew. And then Drew. 412. Drew is at what? 412? 412 and 
And Anna had three. Okay. And that was it. Does that cover everybody? So that was the problem we kind of went into, but um, what this helps us see is how value is different to everybody. So in theory, if I had more books available, which by the way I do in my office, if anybody else would like to support the book industry, um, we could have sold more. So we could have sold two books, and I would have wanted to sell that one to Clayton at $13. Could have got another one. And at five dollars, we could have sold another one. And at four twelve, we could have sold our fifth book. And at three dollars, we could have sold six. And so we kind of got this demand curve. That looks like that. So it kind of maps out the demand curve. And the reason that's important is that too often we get fixed on the price of a product, like that's it's what it's worth, it's the price. We're just almost conditioned to do that. But truly, everybody has different reasons, maybe different things. Like obviously, Jason, my graduate assistant, was trying to butter up uh, to her boss and wanted to be the highest bidder. I mean, that, that's obvious, right? And so we all have different motivations on why we might want the book. She's kind of laughing at that. Okay, so um, I once, uh, in my last microeconomics class, I had a Freakonomics book. I don't think it was this book. Um, and that one you could pick up on Amazon for even cheaper. And it sold for $32 in class. And on Amazon, you could have picked it up for $8. And I did just like what I did with you guys. But what happened is I had a class of 40 students. And two guys just started going off like, you know, it was a competition. $19, $22, you know, you know, just kind of going back and forth. And so it, uh, you know, again, there's different reasons why people are making this. And so the, the value of the book is really in the eye of the beholder, not so much in what we're pricing. And so when we get into later chapters, that's important to realize that concept so that we can potentially come up with ways that we can sell books to different people, the same book to different people at different prices. And that could be a profitable thing to do. And if somebody's willing to pay it and it's voluntary, then isn't that fair? Right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with charging different prices to different people uh, as long as you're not doing it uh, according to uh, breaking our laws according to race, religion, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the protected classes as, as a rule of law that we've identified in the United States. In general, there's nothing wrong with charging different prices to different people. Okay, so if the price was $5, so let's say that the supply curve was $5, I would have sold four books, right? So sometimes when we get into later chapters, this could be like the marginal cost being held constant. You kind of seen a little bit of that. Or a supply curve instead of being upwards. So this is next week material that Levi will get into you with. But let's just say supply equals demand at $4. So we're gonna sell, we're gonna sell four books at a price of $5. Well then, Jason here would have enjoyed what we call consumer surplus. She would have felt like she got a deal. I was able to induce her to pay through this auction process. She revealed that her highest price she was willing to pay was $14 a month. Well, actually, that didn't even get revealed. Right? We got uh, Clayton's uh, max price revealed. But for all I know, Jason would have paid $32 for that thing. Right, Jason? <laughs> no, she's saying no. But you see how we didn't get Jason to reveal her preferences because she won at $14.01. She might have valued it at $16, $20, or who knows, right? So we didn't get that. But we did get it revealed out of Clayton and the rest of the people who quit bidding at some point in the process who probably approximated that. And so, the, dis the difference between what Jason was willing to pay and what she actually paid is called consumer surplus. And so for Clayton, especially, 
for him, we would have got this distance here of, of uh, what do I got here? Eight dollars and fifty-one cents is the amount of consumer surplus that Clayton got. So notice what we're measuring is like the value that you got, almost like how much you profited, if we think about it in those terms, as a consumer. You were able to go to Amazon and you were able to buy the book for five dollars. You were willing to pay thirteen fifty-one, so it's like you profited uh, eight dollars and fifty-one cents. Now. Um, who was our 13 again? That was Alex. Alex only had eight dollars. And then poor old, uh, who was my five dollar? Alex with an I, she didn't get any consumer surplus. So would she have been kind of screwed here since she paid what she was willing to pay, but she didn't get any bonus? No, oh, she's happy, right? So she was willing to pay five dollars, it was five dollars, so True that there's no consumer surplus for Alex with an I, but uh, it was still a good deal. So she still made that deal. So this area here, in general, underneath the demand curve represents consumer surplus. Consumer surplus, CS. So, consumer surplus is the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay, which is the height of the demand curve, that shows their, what they're willing to pay and what they actually pay. Usually the market price for each unit consumed. So just to make kind of a more normal looking demand curve here. So if we have a demand curve, and then I like to just put in a supply curve even though I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit. But what we're gonna learn next week, and we've seen little dabbles of it, where supply intersects demand tells us the equilibrium price that consumers will pay. And let's just say it's uh, $15 for a deluxe pizza. And at $15, there's going to be about 100 pizzas being sold at our pizza shop here in downtown Main Street. But somebody out there was willing to pay more. So the 50th pizza, if there had been only 50 pizzas, Somebody out there was willing to pay $18. And so they got a $3 consumer surplus. And then you add up all of those. And so it ends up kind of being the area underneath this demand curve above the equilibrium price is the area we call consumer surplus. And it's a dollar value. So if our intercept up here, again, just making up numbers, let's call it 20. If the intercept is 20, and then our market price is 15, the consumer surplus can be calculated as one half of base times height, right? Our formula for a triangle. And we got one half of the base, which is 100 units. 100 times the height, which was $20 minus $15 is $5, which means consumers in aggregate got $250 worth of benefit from the market providing this good.
Okay, questions on that? So you see that introduced on consumer surplus. Um, since I've come this far with it, I don't think he covers it in this chapter, but there's also producer surplus, which is related to something we're going to talk about here in a bit. Um, so this area for producers, if I can extend the supply curve down, the 50th unit, producers were willing to supply that at this price. They would have still sold it, if you will. And the reason that is, again, I might be doing too much foreshadowing, so just kind of swallow the supply and sinker for now, but I think it'll help later as you're reviewing your notes. The supply curve is the marginal cost curve. You remember the J-shaped look? Well, long story short, we'll get to it in a bit, but the supply curve and the marginal cost curve are closely related to each other. And it kind of makes sense from what we've been talking about with this whole break-even business too, right? So should I sell another, the, the example I went over earlier today, so if the marginal cost of making a move of selling another unit, if you will, is $3, and the revenue generated by it is $4, should I go ahead and sell it? Yes, right? Because marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. And so what this then says is that, as I sell more and more units, remember the price of hamburgers shot up, right? So that's what the J-shaped marginal cost curve means. Marginal costs are going up. So as I offer another hamburger, the cost might be $3.50, and I can sell it for $4. If the marginal cost of another hamburger is $3.50, and I can sell it for $4, should I sell it? Yes, right? When should I stop? When the marginal cost of a hamburger is $4 and I can sell it for $4, I should still sell that unit because I found the break even, right? I found the price where I'm just breaking even on that very last unit. So that's still good to do. So all of that said, that's kind of what's going on here with this picture is if we look at the cost of the 50th hamburger, it, or what am I on, pizzas, the 50th pizza cost $7, and I sold it for 15 So it's like I made money on the 50th one, right? And then on the 51st one, and the second one, all the way out to here, and so cons or producers are making money, profit at the margin, and so they have producer surplus. Producer surplus is the area of that rectangle. Caution, that is not total profit. But it is this idea that you're going to read in this chapter of markup. So producer surplus is not equal to profit. So note, not profit. It's not equal to profit. It's kind of similar to profit, but it's not the same thing as profit. Do marginal costs involve an analysis of fixed costs? A little review from today and last week. When we calculate marginal cost, are we looking at the fixed costs? No, just the variable costs. That's what's missing here with this, is that we're dealing with marginal cost and price. So we are looking at this uh, markup concept, but it's not the same as total profit. So um, let's kind of put this down here. I'll put this as an extra note for So let's see, note number two. Producer surplus is related to markup. Which is price minus marginal cost. So it's more closely related to markup. All right, 
And so then uh, a couple more little notes here. Note number three. Fun little, hoping these will be easier as you read through the chapter, although Drew's already pretty much knocked this out and he found out. He did <laughs> chapter, sorry, sorry to blow your cover, Drew, but he did chapter six on accident and he didn't do five. So make sure you're watching your chapter numbers is the lesson that Drew helped us remember. Okay. So note number three uh, is that we've got a relationship of the elasticity. So to maximize profits, your markup, price minus marginal cost over price, should be equal to one over the absolute value of the elasticity of demand. So just kind of write this down and then I'll talk you through it. So marginal revenue, the thing I left you with last uh, that should, is in your notes before is produce quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so as you look in here, there's kind of some similar components. So this part, marginal revenue, in a competitive market is your price you're going to sell your product at, right? If I make one more unit, how much revenue is it going to generate? It's going to be the price that I can sell it at, right? So that's where that's kind of the connection here uh, for marginal revenue, and marginal cost. And so then, if you go through that percentage change in quantity business, all of that leads you to this nice little simple uh, formula that says, if I want to maximize profits, look at my markup percentage compared to one over the elasticity of demand. So I'm kind of asking you to kind of swallow this. The book kind of proves it up. I could spend a little bit of time doing some math on the board that I'm not going to bore you with, kind of prove that this all works out in the end. But I think for you, it's more important to kind of internalize this a little bit differently and think about how that relates to elasticity. So um, if the uh, elasticity of demand is... Uh, Let's say 1.2. So, example. If elasticity of demand equals 1.2, is demand elastic or inelastic? Elastic, right? So, anytime it's greater than 1, uh, so we got a 1.2, and marginal cost. Companies typically know the cost per unit, or they can estimate it, right? So when we talk about marginal cost, what they're always wondering is, what should I price my product at? Should I, do I, am I price too high? Am I price too low? Should I raise price? Should I not raise price? So if you have information on the elasticity of demand, this formula is pretty sweet. So if your marginal cost is equal to, um, let's say, $4, What should I set my price at? So to maximize profits, we're going to solve this little equation for P. So go ahead and plug and chug however you want to do it. So I'm going to just kind of do it silently and then let's meet in the middle here. So we got P over P minus MC over P equals 1 over 1.2. 1 Oops. So 
I'm just joining. Hi. Good. Hello. Hi. Uh, just uh, mute your mute your microphone if you want. Gotcha. Would. Gotcha. Uh, unmute it anytime you guys want to speak. Just unmute and interrupt me since I won't always see your hands waving or something. So. Okay. So stay even. Analysis. Okay. So the stay even. Percentage change in quantity to stay even is equal to the percentage change in price over the percentage change in price plus your margin. Where margin is what we put on the board before. Price minus marginal cost over your price. Kind of this markup concept. So the one thing that's a little bit strange with this is that you are dividing by the price, so kind of note that. Like normally we think like, okay, I've got $100 worth of cost. I'm selling it at 120, and so it's like I've marked it up 20%. But that's not the way this margin works here. So it would be, in the case I just said, 120 minus 100 divided by 120 is what this margin calculation is doing. So that's the one thing that's a little bit weird, but it's just the way, uh, kind of the way it works with um, putting together with uh, elasticities and other things. Here's the cool part. This doesn't have elasticities in it, right? It's using the concepts of it because we've got the percentage changes. But again, there's a whole bunch of math that can be done to kind of prove that this guy over here can be transformed into this guy over here. 
But in terms of a company's perspective, this is pretty nice because these are the things we talk about in the boardroom, right? I currently have a price of 120 and our cost is 100. So I can do this calculation. And then the question is, I'm thinking about raising my price 10% by $12 from 120 to 132, right? So you think that'd be a good idea, John? Well, I don't know. Sounds kind of risky to me. Well, in order to stay even with my profits, if I raise my price 10%, and my numbers look like this, I would need to have this percentage change to stay even, right? So we're saying, this is what it would need. Now, I'm hoping that I'll make more money at it. I'm hoping that we'll be in the elastic range of demand so that the price change will lead to even more profits. But to stay even, this is what the percentage change would need to be. Okay, so that's kind of the concept. Uh, question so far? So, so it's the percentage change and they have to equal each other or it's just, you're just trying to figure out what the percentage change in quantity is, or like what, basically what you have to produce in order to stay even. That's right, you're, this is gonna be the calculated number. Okay. Yes, and so we're, we'll do a little example. So example, suppose you've got a 40% margin. 40% margin and you're thinking about a 5% price change. So 5%, 40% uh, margin and considering, considering a uh, increase of price of 5%. So the stay even quantity uh, percentage change is equal to 5 over 5 plus 40. That's it. So all of that junk we did up here that was kind of confusing turns out to be kind of simple, right? So we got the price, percentage change of price of 5%, 5, a margin of 40, and what does that number equal? 11.11% 11 .11%. And then the one thing you got to be careful of is that would that be a negative change or a positive change at the negative 11 if we're talking about an increase of price of 5%? Are we going to lose sales or gain sales when we raise price? We're going to lose sales. Law of demand, right? So what this is saying is that if we only lose 11% sales, we'll stay even. If we lose 9%, that was a good move. Okay? So this is what we need to do to stay even. If we lose 15% of sales, we're going to be worse off. So see how this is related to the elasticity is that we don't need to know the elasticity to calculate what it would be to stay even. And so this is really kind of playing in on that unitary elastic thing. We're finding whether we are elastic or inelastic. This is finding that, that price by this formula. Pretty slick little thing, actually. Pretty cool little tool. OK, any other questions or comments on that? All right. Um, bu, 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 bu. Yeah. Let's uh, note if the actual elasticity of demand is equal to 2.5, this would be a good review. If the actual elasticity of demand is 2.5, should the company Uh, increased price. Five percent. 
So now I'm kind of taking this a level deeper. Remember when I first did this, this is the state even quantity. Now I'm saying, well, suppose we did some research and it's 2.5. Should we do a 5% increase? What's the elasticity of demand formula? That I expect you to be able to look up, not even have memorized at this point. Elasticity of demand equals, look back in your notes. Excellent. Percentage change in quantity or percentage change in price. Who said that? That was you. Extra credit for being the fastest person digging up the details. All right. Excellent work. So of these three things, what do we know from this little problem I've got worked out? Denominator. We know the denominator and we know this, right? Remember, it's always negative. That'll just kind of help our signs. Equals percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in price, which is 5%. We can just use a 5. You can use the 0.052, but as long as you stay consistent, then you're, then you're fine. So what's the percentage change in quantity going to be? Twelve point five times two point five negative twelve point five, right? Twelve point five. So should we do it? No, no. No. To stay even, it would have needed to be eleven percent. If the elasticity is actually two point five then we're going to lose 12% and you're going to lose money. Had the elasticity of demand, just to pick out a number here, had it been uh, 1 or 1.1 1 .1 or whatever, maybe we could even pick 2, which, yeah, 2 works, right? If the elasticity of demand had been 2, the percentage change in quantity would have been 10, negative 10, and we would have been better off because this was the state even quantity. Okay, that is chapter six. Any final questions on what we've covered so far? Are we ready to roll into seven? All right, chapter seven it is. So let's see. Um, yeah, we'll start off doing a little board work for you. Um, so we're going to bring in some long-run concepts here with economies of scale and economies of scope, and the author gets into these learning curves. Okay, so chapter seven. All right, so you remember from our uh, grill when we had the tabletop last week, um, the law of diminishing returns kicks in and eventually causes your cost at the margin to increase, potentially exponentially. As we added more and more russes, the 11th rust, the 15th rust, the 22nd rust, to a fixed grill top. So we had the short run analysis because the grill top was fixed. 
Notice if we were in the long run and demand supported it, we would not only hire more Russes, but we would lease more drill space. And so then we could proportionately better keep up with demand by having more drill space and more Russes. But in the short run, if at least one resource is fixed, then we're going to run into this problem of increasing costs. So sometimes we call this the law of increasing costs is kind of a kissing cousin or a result of the law of diminishing marginal uh, product. Okay, so um, that eventually leads to pulling up average costs and uh, somebody in their sheets said average and marginal and that was on somebody else's comments before too at, at the start. So um, if it helps, remember my GPA example. So if we have a semester GPA of 3.0 and then the next semester we get a 2.0, our GPA falls, right? It comes down, but it doesn't come all the way down to a two. It just falls a little bit. Maybe it goes to 2.7. Next semester, we have an overall GPA of 2.7. We get a semester GPA of 2.7. It stays the same. And then finally, the following semester, we get a, a 4.0 but now we still had a 2.7, so it's not going to go up to a 4.0, but it is going to cause our average to rise, right? So that's kind of what this is saying here. Same thing with hamburgers and pizzas and beer and chicken wings. Uh, if, uh, increasing marginal costs is going to lead that average cost curve to increase. Okay. Um, so let's see. I'll let you read that. So graphically, when we have that J-shaped marginal cost curve, the upward slope is where diminishing returns has kicked in. And that's what's causing the cost to go up for each additional unit. A little bit of review for starters. And then we're cutting through the average total cost and average variable cost, depending on how much fixed cost you are, it always lies below it and then it bottoms out and then the difference between the two. So you'll see some graphs where they might show the average variable cost, they might show the average fixed cost, so be prepared that not every graph might not have every curve on it, um, like we've done when we've prepared them. So you gotta get uh, kind of used to reading that. So um, the author identifies a case he calls learning curves, where early on in the process, we can lower costs because we're learning and becoming more productive. So um, what I brought you through with the hamburger example was specialization. Remember when I added the second rust, the first rust might be able to concentrate on patting the hamburgers, and the second rust might be able to handle all the toppings for the burgers. And so through specialization, we might be able to increase productivity of hamburgers. And that would be on the down slope of the marginal cost. What he's highlighting here is that in other uh, different types of production, we might have a learning curve where people become more productive because they're making more of them, right? As you learn the process, uh, you become more productive. And so businesses, of course, face this uh, cost all the time. That's one of the costs of turnover is that you got a new employee and depending on what they're doing at your work, it might take two weeks to train them on how to not burn french fries at McDonald's, or it might take six months to really train them on the sophisticated sales software that we use at our company and establish networks of relationships in our vertical supply chain of how our company you know, sells to various people in a global complex market where we have clients in India, we have clients in South Africa, we have clients in Ireland, we have different languages, we have different time zones. And so the learning curve could be really long in some production and very short in others. So this concept is going on where we have marginal costs that are falling and bringing down our average cost curve. So it's at kind of the front end. So we use this airplane manufacturing where 
as we start to learn and make more airplanes, since we don't tend to make a ton of them, we can actually drive down our average cost and keep doing that because we haven't hit that intersection point yet. So you can kind of imagine we're on this section over here. So this could be kind of the learning curve section as we're, as we're going. And we haven't reached this point of diminishing returns yet. So in some industries that are big ticket items or very complex, um, they might have this learning curve concept more than others. All right, questions or comments so far there? All right. Um, so graphically, the marginal cost curve is here, and the average cost curve is coming down. So average costs are falling over that production range. What they're not showing is that this graph really continues on. Diminishing returns eventually kicks in and cuts through the minimum, and marginal cost goes over here. That's the whole picture, right? So when I said this is the front side of that picture, that's all we're looking at in this graph for this uh, learning curve concept conceptually. Okay, good there so far? All right, so Gibson, do we have any guitar players online or in the room? No people with musical talents? How about other instruments? Just curious. High school band. Who played in high school band? I used to play guitar a long time ago. You used to play guitar a long time ago. Jason was in band. What did you play, Jason? The clarinet. Clarinet. You played the saxophone in middle school. OK, so now the truth comes out. All right, we got some musical talent here. All right, so. Um, so Gibson is famous guitar, right? So Ted Nugent and all the rock stars, they've got themselves a, a high-end Gibson. And some of those can go really uh, expensive. So the fingerboard is the part with the fingering, right? Think? And <laughs> rosewood is used for budget. Ebony is used for high-end. So it's kind of expensive. And over the years, ebony, has been a difficult to get of clean ebony. So brown streaks are kind of a blemish, and you can't charge as high of a price for the guitar if it doesn't have the, the pure ebony. So we could use ebony on the budget guitars, which would be better than using rosewood and might be a way to get some other guitars sold. So the point with all this is, what does marginal cost look like now? So cost, fixed cost, plus marginal cost times quantity. So this is our variable cost factor here. So what is the cost of the ebony? If we have to buy ebony in bulk, some of the ebony we get is streaked, some of it's not. Right? So when we start thinking about that, what are the right costs to consider when we have it anyway? Say that again? Yeah, th and that's what we want to kind of think about is what, what is the cost of the cheaper ebony to you? <laughs> is it free? So how much you're willing to pay more than what the cheaper uh, guitar is? Yeah, so what we're thinking though is I buy ebony, I, I'm a high end guitar. I kind of start the story in reverse. So I, I produce high end guitars where I like to have the, the clean, pure uh, ebony. And so now, oh, we could do a budget guitar with a street. So when I go to do my little formulas here, like price minus marginal cost, what's the marginal cost of the street ebony? 
is it zero? Or if I buy ebony, uh, $100,000 worth of ebony in bulk, and then as they process it, some of it's streaked, some of it's not, right? Is the marginal cost really free? Do we attribute all the costs to the high-end guitar? Those are kind of the questions that we need to kind of consider on this, that it might not be real straightforward with this new concept of economies of scale and scope. So, is it free? What conditions would make it free to us at the margin? Give me a story with the guitar, and you can kind of make assumptions, but in what sense is that could be considered kind of free, or how could we maximize profits? What would be the right thing to think about with these lower end guitars? Which, by the way, the lower end guitar just has the streaked ebony, right? Otherwise, the rest of the guitar parts are just the guitar parts. So let's see here. Give me a number between seven and twenty-two. Oh, why did you pick such a big number? I almost wasn't gonna do that. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20, 21. You're the lucky winner. So, you got the story down? We buy ebony to make our high end guitars. It's got to be pure. We spend whatever we spend. I just made up a number $100,000 in bulk, but not all of it can be used because some of it's streaked, some of it's pure. So, what could you? think of, like, what would be the proper way to say, what should we do with this street ebony? We don't want to use it on the high end. We don't want to use it on the high end, right? For sure, we're going to keep that market se separate and segregated. So we got our high end, they're kind of our high value. We're going to start to use that term as we get into the later weeks. Kind of our high value customers. That's the rock stars and you people with more money than God, and even though they don't know how to play, they're going to buy the best guitar ever, right? Resell it? So we could resell it. Yeah, that's definitely one consideration. Like, can we just dump this on the market, and what would be our resale price? Absolutely. Kind of similar to that building that we had with that other uh, project. Okay, so what can I resell it for versus doing what with the budget guitar? How would we analyze that? Stop making like not buy buy the rosewood. Yeah. Because it's more like it says like it's better than the rosewood and it's a cost and quality advantage. So instead of you just buy hundred thousand dollars worth of ebony and spend nothing on rosewood. Right. So if we did that, how much money would we need to make with the street ebony versus going a different direction of selling it? We need to make yeah. We need to make as as much as we would have on the resale, right? So now we can kind of think about our implicit costs of selling it on the market and getting X, or if I can use the street ebony and do a budget guitar, what price could I sell that budget guitar? At? And then we can be back to doing this type of analysis, so, right? So what would be the price of the street ebony guitar? that I could get knowing that my cost is just the cost of the um, regular, the other guitar parts to make the rest of the guitar, all the variable costs associated with that, right, is what we have in the guitar. And then um, what this foregone resale price would be of the street ebony. All right, so that kind of gives us a little taste of moving this problem um, so, uh, scope economies, 
is what we do like at Ottawa. At Ottawa University, what's our what's our product? What do we sell? Education. Education, right? So we're a tuition driven place. And so we have to hire GAs and we have a president and we have some accounting functions and we've got all kinds of departments. We have professors, uh, we have buildings with chairs and tables and all of that to provide this. So what else could we do? What other products could be profitable for Ottawa to do knowing that we've got accounting, all that stuff I just mentioned? What else could we do? Rent out use of the facilities. So we could, if we have the conference room upstairs, we can rent it out for wedding receptions of the chapel, could be for weddings or something, right? So <laughs> once we start to do that, we're starting to think of this concept of economies of scope. So can we offer multiple products to kind of leverage our assets in multiple ways? That's in general what economies of scope is. So instead of offering a single product, we're offering multiple products. And that's part of the reason we're doing it, uh, the economies of scope. So for this particular thing, we've got a small family owned company makes, sells, and distributes popular breakfast sausage. Can this firm realize economies of scope? What else could they do rather than just their one breakfast sausage that grandpa's recipe from 1936 and this is not selling, selling good, what might they be able to do to realize economies of scope? Different forms of sausage. So we might be able to make links versus patties. Um, we add a little bit of maple into it, so it could be changing the recipe and offering different uh, different varieties, right? So one's the spicy pepper one, and one's the granddad's old favorite, which is their popular one. But in order to do that, what do they need to do? If they offer spicy versus granddad's old recipe, what would actually need to be done at the company? Imagine, it's kind of hard sometimes, but imagine this is what we do. We were making it, selling it, and distributing it. Okay, so we got new resources, so we have a new supplier. Maybe it's not too hard, but we do have to get whatever those ingredients are, okay? What else do we need to do? We already maximize the production. That one person take away from a lot of production. Okay, we possibly have to take it. So yeah, you're right, and so if we do take away we have to change the machine around, right? Something, extra ingredients have to be added, take away granddad's ingredients and add the sriracha and other things to make our spicy one, right? So something has to be changed with the production process. Now, if demand is such that we are making and meeting demand for granddad's old recipe, working nine to five, Monday through Friday, we might have some excess capacity for the machines. So now in order to make the spicy recipe, we still make granddads from nine to five, but we have a second shift added on. And so from five to 10, maybe it's just an extra five hours a day, a new shift of people comes in, they switch around the ingredients, that's part of their deal, and they make the spicy recipe for the next five hours, right? And so there, we're not having to shut down granddads production at all. We're trying to leave that untouched, but then we're moving into the spice, right? And so the machines that we're using, we're having a little bit of variable cost of changing the machines over and the new ingredients, but we're not going to have to attribute the machine other than maybe some gas or power or something, but the actual cost of the expensive machine that's being used to make the sausage patties, we might not have to do. Okay, good. So here's kind of a quick little formula that just, it's really just to illustrate the concept. And that is the cost of making the patties, spicy and granddad's recipe together in the business 
is less than the cost if we were to make them in separate facilities. Right? So instead of opening up another business, buying another machine, and adding on to granddad, um, we enjoy some cost savings. So whenever this holds for multiple products, you've got this concept of economies of scope. Okay, questions on that one now, so far. Okay, so scope economies at Ottawa University or your company. We have some other people in that aren't uh, affiliated. Most of the, the group here is Ottawa University. But we've got Karen and Anna. Um, Anna, what, what do you do? You said uh, you told me at the beginning and then I lost. Oh, IT. See, I have a. I do. I work in medical IT. Yeah, medical IT. Okay, so you're doing medical like records and whatever information for the healthcare system, which is enormous. Correct. Keep track for of a it. small company among other named things. Cerner. Oh, at Cerner, you work for Cerner. Or? I do work for Cerner. Yes. Oh, okay. So do you live in Kansas City area? I do. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, so you're almost local. You can come to class if you if you ever feel like it. You're welcome to come to class. Just so you know. Um, no, they didn't tell me. I thought you were at Ottawa. Yeah, no, we're at, so we're at Ottawa, Kansas. Okay, gotcha, yeah, yeah. So it would be a bit of a drive for you, but if for some uh -huh. reason you felt like doing it, the offer's open. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you could come to campus. And we've had students commute longer distances than that sometimes, so I just thought I'd throw that Thank out. you. So, um, okay, so yeah, at Cerner, uh, we could think about multiple things that they do. So Cerner is, that's how they made all their money for the most part was in medical records type of stuff, right? Medical IT. That's correct. But do they yeah. do other, do they do other areas as well? Correct. Um, the team that I work with is focused around um, not only it's under over overarching population health. So we look at diabetics and best practices. You know, the diabetics should have these labs done every year or their blood pressure should be this. Um, additionally, we focus on a lot of what, um, unfortunately, where healthcare is based on reimbursement for organization. Yeah, so that they can <laughs> suck off the government teeth, so to speak. Yes, uh, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's, we'll get to that topic actually later <laughs> this chapter, how incentives can be distorted and we might spend more time lobbying our politicians or shifting our business focus to where government handouts are or whatever. Uh, but that's, that's kind of a different topic that we'll get to uh, in the later chapters. So uh, now is there, is there any, is there IT support outside of the healthcare industry though that Cerner does? So yes, we do have um, actually the campus out at Legend yeah. Um, that's that's what they focus on is offering that the the technical support to our clients. Okay. So and that could be in other types of industries like um, food food. Uh, oh no! In that aspect, no. It is all medical. It is all medical. Okay. Just different areas of the medical field. Okay. Correct. So, um, but so anytime they're offering other different areas that they expand into that's a different type of product offering because the thing that they're doing in that area isn't the same as what they're doing uh, before if it would have been, you know, hospital records. So back to Ottawa then, scope economies at Ottawa. We mentioned one, rent, le leasing out the, the building. Um, like selling like stuff in the bookstore? Yeah, sure, the bookstore stuff. Yeah, little little profit centers there. With the Starbucks? The Starbucks, the food, just food in general, really, right? I mean, if, depending on how we look at uh, the college experience, it's really a bundled good. Uh, we're offering dorms. Does every college offer dorms? No. You can live totally off campus. Uh, Johnson County Community College right down the way, and they have zero dorms and 20,000 students. So you can run a university without bundling housing and meal plan and student activities and going to World's Fund and whatever all the other stuff that we do, we're kind of packaging something. It's not just straight education, right? 
And so there, there's kind of a couple different things that we might be doing that way. Um, we also ha end up having, a, as a revenue generator, the uh, um, fundraising department, right? So instead of putting butts into seats, we have people that are out hitting up uh, alumni and other people for support. So we can have uh, fundraising efforts to, to come in, and that could be utilizing Toy Jones and some of the infrastructure that we have. So lots of different ways we can get uh, scope economies building uh, in the real world. And the reason that might seem kind of like a no-duh type of thing, um, but the reason it's important is some of the stuff we do here as kind of baby steps to learning some of these economic concepts is we'll be talking about a single product like I did with the hamburgers, right? So we only make hamburgers, that's all we make. We don't make french fries, we just do hamburgers. So we talk about a kind of a single product firm. In reality, most firms are offering, offering kind of multiple products of some form. It's, it's pretty rare that you're really cranking out a single, a single product. Okay, so um, to extend the, this a little bit more, we got a pet food company, 2,500 products. So 200 different formulas of dog food and other things. So um, this one's kind of, this is not related to this story. Uh, the authors got this from somewhere else. But um, Marguerite Gibson, we, you know, we got the Gibson Student Center. She, her husband and her um, owned a, a dog food company here in Ottawa. And that's where they made their millions is they had a successful company. He was a hunter, I believe. And he found that his dogs were like, had a great coat and stuff. He kind of came up with his own formula of what he fed his hunting dogs. And then he's like, well, we should just mass produce this. And so they started off with a little plant. And before you know it, they've got some major thing. And then eventually they sold out to one of the major brands like Farina or something and, and had a little cha-ching. So she gave a, a million dollars for that gift. She never even went to OU. That was just to kind of help support Ottawa community. So she's not even an alumni, but she's uh, donated the, uh, some other money in town to different things, um, uh, different uh, causes, because she kind of felt like she wanted to give this money while she was still alive. Her husband had passed away, so that's kind of cool thing. All right, so how many can we do and still be saving money? So you guys know about Walmart? What are they known for? Low price. Low price. Low price guarantee. And so really, there's some interesting economic studies on Walmart that um, no other company's really done so much to help the poor around the world than Walmart. So we complain about, oh, all of our main streets have vacant signs because Walmart came into our town and stole all of our jobs and whatever. And so that might be true that there was a substitution effect of going to Walmart for low prices. But Walmart has really helped keep in check Target and Amazon. Amazon's kind of helped keep each other in check. But as we've had these companies, they've all had to really compete with Walmart in terms of at least having that as an available um, substitute. So what did they find their demand curves doing when Walmart, Sam Walton, started to come into price? Was their product becoming more elastic or less elastic? Oh, less I thought we forgot about that. Now we're on the chapter seven. More. more elastic? Sound good? So more substitutes, more elastic, right? So more competition when there was more substitutes available. Now all of a sudden they have their demand curves getting a little flatter, which forced them to have to lower their prices too, right? So that's kind of related to that. All right, so they get some pressure. Uh, Walmart's been known to like kind of beat up on their uh, not literally, but uh, you know, kind of negotiate hard for their suppliers. Hey, you want to sell at Walmart, you better give me your rock bottom price. So the company went down to 70 with 13 formulas to go to Walmart. So this led to 25% savings on the cost. Whoa, wait a second. Economies of scope 
was that the concept where what? When we do multiple products, how do we define the economies of scope? Lowers your cost. Lowers your cost. So more products together can be done at a lower <laughs> cost than doing them separately. This is saying, well, wait a second. We're doing less offerings, and we got some cost savings. So the point is, is that the answer might not always be to make more stuff, right? Depending on your demand. And where that came from was with the turnover time of the machines. So now instead of having to run the machine and then turn it over and then put a new one in and change up the machine, kind of that process we were doing with the breakfast sausages, um, they were able to run the machine more continuously and shrink some of those variable costs to the tune of uh, 25%. Okay, so learning curves. Suppose that every time you double your production, you decrease your cost by 50%. So at the margin, the first unit is 64, the second drops to 32, and then when we double from 2 to 4, it gets cut in half again. But in between is the third one. So 21, 16, 13, right? So that's kind of the path following that uh, deal. On a potential project for four units, what is your break even price? What price do you need to get to break even on four units? First one sixty four. So somebody comes in and says, I'd like to do four units. And so we're kind of think about what are we going to do to break even? Levi and actually and I were just doing this recently. We have a potential research project that might be coming up, and we're like, okay, how many hours do we need to spend to break even? So what's the total? If I do four units, what is my marginal cost? Kind of total of all four units. One hundred twenty-four. So sixty-four plus thirty-two plus twenty-one plus the uh, sixteen. Hundred what? 124. And so then, what is your break even price if you're doing four units and this is your kind of accumulated marginal cost? So, this is kind of the sum of your marginal cost. What price do I need to get on average for the, each of the four units? Thirty-one. So what are you doing? Dividing. Just divide by four. Just divide that by four, right? So divide by the quantity, and so on average, I would need to get uh, what is it then? Thirty-one. So if I get a price of thirty-one dollars, then I'd be doing okay on this. I would I would break even anyway. Okay. So after you get the four-unit deal, you get another project. For two more units, like somebody just came out of the blue. People started talking. Like you landed this contract, you looked at it, and you came up with this analysis, and now somebody says, "Hey, how about if you do uh, two for us? Twelve dollars. So how'd you do that?" Okay, so fifth plus the six is twenty-four. Divided by 2 is 12. So we got a $12 price for these two, and we're looking at 31 for the other. So how's that going to shake out here? Here's the numbers. We're going to run a table like we did before. So there's your marginal cost numbers, 1 through 6. And then you got your variable costs. Notice we're just adding, right? So we end up having our 
our total variable cost, and then our average variable cost is here. So would you ever want to take a deal on those last two units for, um, I don't know, $20? Somebody came up to you and said, hey, I heard you were doing four. Uh, I just heard that you were getting in the business of doing these, and I could use two of those. Um, but I can only do $20 per unit. Would that be uh, a good deal if that's how the numbers are shaping up? What was our rule? So we covered this at the beginning here for related to average variable costs. What did we need to do? Maybe less than uh, nine, eight. Yeah. So you wouldn't want to do So you need to be higher five, than your yeah. average variable costs, right? See so we're, we're not adding. So yeah, we'd be lower than our average variable cost. So let's go back to the original deal. So we got the original deal. We calculate we're at $31. So with that customer, if we sold it to him for $35, we'd be making money, right? <laughs> we'd be good on, on making some money. And then at $20, we wouldn't want to do it. Could we do it at $20 too, though? <laughs> yes, but aren't we breaking the rule? going on here? Something seems a little fishy. In order to make that work, what would need to be our pricing? Can we charge just one price? No. But if we can price discriminate, charge different prices to different people for the same product, this could work. Now, if this guy goes and talks to this guy and says, hey, I got two units at $20. What? I'm never doing business with those guys again, right? So one of the things we'll talk about in future, I don't even think it'll be next week, but two weeks from now, on what you can and can't do when you start price discriminating. But that's what's going on here, and so it's, it's, the reason we're bringing this up now is that the rule that I gave you before with price needs to be higher than average variable cost is true with a single price or single product concept. But if we're able to use different prices, we might be able to kind of abandon that or look at it in isolation. We're doing the same thing here. We just know that we need to price it higher than 12, and it would be profitable. Uh, to do that. Okay, so I don't know, did we do our math a little wrong? Yeah, we did 31, yeah. so yeah, 33, yeah, 33 was this, just so I thought that was 33, yes, four times three, 133, oh, yeah, 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 so it was the 124 that was on, okay. Yeah. Uh, just so that you guys have <laughs> I was like so confused. Just so you have it clean on your notes. Yeah, that's what was going on. Once I saw that, I wanted to just save it to the end. But okay. So, um, okay. So last thing we need to uh, discuss is the um, economies of scale. So I'm just going to do that on the board, and then we're going to call it a night here. So give me just a few more minutes. This won't take very long. It, it's really similar to the uh, learning curve concept. Um, but the learning curve was the idea of being early on in the production process. And economies of scale is actually a long run concept. So economies of scale. 
All right, so let me give you the definition for starters. So um, as you increase, as you increase the scale of production, which is the increase in quantity. So basically, as you increase the scale of production, long run average cost, average total cost, fall. So there's a decrease in long run average total cost. Okay, so I think this is a nice way to end tonight here. We'll tell a little story. You start a business in your garage, right? So it's just you and another person, maybe it's Steve Jobs and uh, what, 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 whatever, whatever the name was. So you start off in a small uh, thousand square foot garage space. And you currently, operating out of your garage, can kind of minimize cost at 100 units of production. In other words, things work pretty good in your garage at 100 units and the 1,000 square foot space. Now, as your company starts to grow, you're starting to get more and more orders at 150 units. And you can make them out of your garage but the Russes start banging into each other in the thousand square foot space. So the Russes aren't quite as productive, which then raises your cost of production to $20 from, 20, or from $18, just making up some numbers here. So then you say, you know what? I think a business is gonna stay at 150. Let's go lease some space on Ottawa Main Street. And so you go ahead and lease some space on Ottawa Main Street, and sure enough, you're able to, in a medium-sized space of, I don't know, 2,000 square feet, again, just kind of making up some numbers, you're able to drop your cost to $16 per unit. Pretty good, right? So now you've got the Russes not banging into each other as much, and if production stays at 150, you're doing pretty good. But notice if production falls back to your old levels, at 100, you've got that expensive rent. And so now you might be kicking yourself like, oh, we should have stayed in the garage. Maybe we moved too fast into the big space, right? And so that's a possible space. Well, maybe business continues to be good and you are out at 200 units. And again, costs go up now a little bit where you see your costs rising and you say maybe it's time to go get some space out in the industrial park. And so you get the large space in the industrial park. And sure enough, you're able to drop your cost down again, maybe to $15. Okay, so here's economies of scale as you increase the size proportionately of both your capital and your labor, you're able to see long run costs go down. So don't do this on your papers or you can do it on the side, but there's an infinite number of buildings we could have been in. We could have been here, 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 we could have been here. And so, in the long run, we can be in any size facility, and so the outer envelope of the short run curves creates the long run average total cost curves, whereas these were the short run average total cost curves when the building was fixed at a certain size. Okay? So economies of scale, as I increase the scale of production, I can have some cost savings.